Welcome to AI Dungeon 2. I don't really know what I'm doing here, so I'm going to dive right in. Let's see. You are an astronaut being sent into space on a glorious mission to find out what's on the other side of a black hole. You are accompanied by a crew of fearless space explorers. They include scientists, soldiers, and eh, random celebrities. The ship has launched successfully, and you are approaching the event horizon. One small step for man, you announce. One giant leap for... Okay, that was the boring, most boring answer that you could have possibly provided. <laughs> it's really stuck on that, isn't it? All right, all right, all right. One giant leap for... Here, let's undo that. For... Suddenly, something unexpected happens. The spaceship... Oh my... The spaceship is overcome by an intense beam of light and loses power. Every system shuts down, including life supports. The entire crew is killed, and their bodies are left abandoned in space. You drift away with the rest of the dead. Let's retry that. The spaceship suddenly stops working. The engine stops running and all power disappears. Even your artificial gravity seems to be out of order. In an instant, you feel weightless. You look out the window and see a wave of matter approaching the ship. Is it a wave of extremely dense matter? Has a star suddenly collapsed? What the hell is that? You ask the, the scientist to your left, whose name is... What the hell is going on with the Avatar's mouth? It's reacting to the music, what? That's not supposed to happen. Hold on. Oh no. No, it's set to microphone. Very tempted to just leave it like that, but... Microphone is pushing on the right thing. PC is pushing on the right thing. Alright. What I'll do is just straight up disable the whole... Uh, face tracking thing. I'm not gonna work then. Oh no! I did disable lip sync and it's still doing it. This is just straight up the face tracker is really freaking out. Uh, let me try an overhead light real quick. Wow. Oh, you know what? Even better. I don't mean overhead lights. I can turn on. land that I set up for just such an occasion. Sun is going down earlier these days, so I shouldn't be surprised at this. All right, let's turn that on. Shift around to get my earbuds in. Try and get the microphone a bit further out of the way. If 
face tracker is now okay. Let's recalibrate the head pose. And then turn on the lip sync again. There's that. All right. I've got that out of the way. Uh, what the hell is that? You ask the scientist to your left whose name is Julia. That, she replies, is an end to all life as we know it. Out of the black hole pours an endless torrent of cats. They are not your fluffy, humane house cats. Oh, no. They are... Dot, dot, dot. They are gargantuan, even compared to an elephant. Their heads are the size of oak trees, and they sport fangs the length of sabers. Worst of all, they seem to have an almost human intelligence as they glare at you with hateful green eyes. Run a scan on these cats, you order. Find out what makes them tick. The crew members start acting immediately. Unfortunately, these cats don't exactly cooperate. They seem to take exception to the scans, and a few have somehow managed to float their way onto the ship with the intent of tearing your crew members apart. All hands to battle stations! You order. Uh, let's see, you need a name Milo! Get out your... Get out your twisty knife. We're going to need it. <laughs> okay. Let's retry that. You draw out your own knife as the cats swarm around the crew. This is like a nightmare, you think, struggling to awaken. But this is all too real. The first few planks of wood give way as the monstrous cats begin to flood onto the ship. Before long, the cats have taken control. The cat captain paces back and forth on the bridge. Ears twitching. Continue, he says. I would like to see these specimens. Soon enough, the cats lead your crew members off to wherever they take things like that. The remaining crew members address you. You put on a brave face for them, but in reality, you are terrified. You do a three-point jig for the crew to lift their spirits. but it just ends in tragedy as your head is cleaved in half by the captain's mighty blade. You blink as the helmet, as the VR helmet, um, you know what, I did VR before, so let's not do that. Uh, a whistle sounds and everyone stops what they are doing. This was a simulation and you failed. This was one of your best attempts. Better luck next time! Cats have a history of getting inside spaceships and bringing them down. Ever vigilant, you must defend yourself with all your might. You start by choosing the weapon you think will work best against cats. The internet! With your head on low, you head over to the space cafeteria. Taking out your laptop and googling cats to find out what their weakness is. Julia and Milo plop beside you with their trays of space food.
the food growing ability was successful, but it requires a lot of nutrients, so space food is still being made. After the interminable wait for the sites to load, you discover the key to destroying all the cats. Insults. It says here that cats are weak to insults. You say to Julia and Milo, what do you think? Trying to get it into uh, dialogue, because that's really where it shines. We'd have to try it. It's better than sending people, right? You survey the camps and find that one has already been destroyed by a giant cat-like creature, which killed most of the inhabitants. I don't know about that. I mean, we're only sending people we don't care about. But you care about all humans, Julia says. No, I most certainly do not, you protest aghast. You care about the ones on the station and their clones, the ones we can resend. I care... Be I... Don't care so much as I appreciate them, you say. Sundere as all heck. Milo, what about you? Do you care about clones? I have mixed feelings about them, he admits. They're all unique snowflakes, so I don't actively hate them. But, no offense, I'd rather not send smart people into danger if I can get dumb ones to do it. You're talking about the Xerox phenomenon. Right? How every clone is dumber than the original? Exactly. Well, Julia says with a playful grin, I'm starting to think that it's time I take you out to see the real world. You look up in surprise and, judging by the slack jaw of your co-station director, so does he. The real world? Yes. Contrary to what you're saying, the real world is not after these cats. You could send all the people that we have, they would come right back, most of them severely wounded. It's time we stopped relying on the quick fix and go for something long term. We need to put an end to these beasts. You're saying we need to send our best out there? That's exactly what I'm saying. Well then, Director Kyle says... Dot, dot, dot. Better get to it. Which group shall we send first? I think we should send this idiot, she says, gesturing towards the head scientist. He keeps complaining that we don't send him people, so let's just send him to a nicey death. The rest of your staff laughs. Yeah! You realize the cafeteria has been turned into an impromptu war room. You quickly commandeer a screen and put up your best PowerPoint presentation on how to get rid of people everyone hates because they're Debbie Downers. We're going to rid ourselves of those moods with fatal climate conditions. Who shall we send out there? The sadistic bastard asks, rubbing his hands together. I say we send the cafeteria cooks out there. I mean, who cares about them? We should send all the lawyers, you say. Let them earn their keep for once. Yeah, the group cheers. Get the lawyers! You're all insane, a voice says. Out of the crowd, a short bearded man in a ball cap appears. It's Franklin's, the veterinarian who gave you your assignments. You shake your head and sigh as Franklin's shows up 
to spoil the mood once again. You attempt to distract him by throwing a ball out of the room. You throw it too hard, however, and it ends up bouncing off his face and throwing him to the floor. Seems that if you can't keep him busy with animal cruelty, you'll have to take more radical measures. His views are infectious. Hands up, everyone who du who thinks we should treat cats uh, should treat cats with respect. You call out. I love cats. Oh, here we go. No one raises their hands. Now hands up if you think we should kill the cats! Almost the entire room responds in the affirmative. You look around. There's one major opponent is sending lawyers out to die in the cold, and that's the head scientist. I challenge you to a duel of reason, you say to the head scientist. If I win, the lawyers must be sent out to die. And if I lose, you can have three wishes. The room gasps. Then, after a moment, the room erupts into cheers. They start lining up to watch the duel and placing bets. The AI robot that inhabits the refrigerator for some reason comes out and charges people money to see the fight from a cage match style ring that spontaneously appears. You line up. You take your position in the red corner while the head scientist takes his position in the blue corner. The rules of the duel are simple. Now, you know what? There are three simple rules to a duel. The first rule is... Uh, first rules, yeah, okay. First rule is... That arguments matter more than facts. Secondly, if you stop arguing, you lose. And lastly, violence against your opponent is prohibited. It's about convincing the audience rather than beating the shit out of them. It's not a fair fight at all, really. The head scientist starts on the defensive. You dress like my uncle, you tell the head scientist. Badly. I dress like my uncle, yes, but he is a multimillionaire, hence I am not. Is uncle a multimillionaire? Oh, gee, maybe that's why he has a shop at big and tall stores. The crowd roars with laughter, cheering you on. You do a self-satisfied uh, boogie dance and follow up with a snazzy retort. Your science is boring to listen to, and nothing ever happens. Yes, well, at least something happens in your ridiculous stories. You nonchalantly flick a piece of lint off your shoulder. Then you run full force into the science machine, toppling him to the floor and jump on top of him. Anything is more interesting than, than in your <laughs> anything is more interesting than your stories, old man. The scientist bounce suddenly lifts up off the floor, glowing and incandescent. Have you ever heard the story of the witch? The crowd gasps. What? A twist! Yeah, yeah, three wishes, you say, throwing a lazy right at the scientist, but you miss and hit the floor. The scientist floats in midair. 
All right, I think I could do better than that. Yeah, you know, that's not... The, st the story of the witch is as follows. There was a witch. And then... And then there wasn't. There was a liar. And then there wasn't. There was a wish. And then there wasn't. The end. The scientist floats away and you stand up and dust off your hands. Yeah, well, at least my stories are interesting. Bye bye You quickly uh, twist around a stripper pole and hold up a hand. Signifying he should speak into it. The crowd roars with approval at this unjust dismissal of science. They start chanting your name, and after mo a moment of basking in the attention your ego desperately needs, you silence the crowd. Make no mistake, my friends, the horror of science has been put in her place tonight. That sounded a lot dirtier than it should have. Now let's throw this scientist to the ice cats. That's a metaphor, by the way. It represents moving past the narrative in the story to the next stage of introspection and analysis. No, it doesn't. There are literally ice cats out there, and you're going to throw the head scientist right into their midst to be torn apart by icy claws. I like this guy, someone cheers out. You waste no more time and run into the next room. It's your typical ice room that you've come to expect in the competition. Wait, what's this? In the middle of the room is Olaf, surrounded by cold, but not freezing cold. You remember that Olaf is... Warm. Very warm and cold temperatures make for very cruel puns. There's no way this ice room is going to make the normally happy and merry Olaf into an eye wind card. You reluctantly turn up the thermostat and thaw out Olaf into a warm popsicle. Okay, now it's getting, now it's just very confused. Which is fair. Besides making for horrible puns, ice would just slow him down and cause him to stick around too long. You need him out there taking out the bad guys. Three or four of the evil lawyers are pretty much frozen, but now all of them are. The torture is finally over. Just so you remember, you tell Ju Julia and uh, Milo, your partners in crime, we are astronauts on a spaceship. There are cats out there, are evil space cats that are out to destroy humanity. We are now throwing all the lawyers and the evil and the head scientist to the uh, to the snow cats because we want to be in a better mood. Do you agree? I agree. Julia says. Boring, you say. Sure, he shrugs. 
Oh yeah, Julia is a guy's name too sometimes, huh? Uh, your hunger is gone, and you're full of milk and cookies now, so you're satisfied with this outcome. You toss the meat popsicles that were formerly lawyers and scientists down into the snow and watch with fascination as the snow cats come out. The snow cats are unusual in that they walk on their hind legs, wear business suits, and carry laser guns. With a chuckle, you safely watch as the snow cats begin to eat your opponents. What's going to happen now? The spaceship will collide with Earth. Is that a good thing? You ask. No, it's going to wipe out all of humanity. That's a bad thing, you decide. What can we do? You can push the intellectual elite into the snowcats to distract them. He points at them. You immediately push the top third of the spacecraft you're in over, dumping everyone inside out into the snow. Julia, 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 Julia. Oh, God, what was his name? He did. M he was M. Bison in the Street Fighter movie. That was his last role. I keep I keep thinking Julia Childs, and that's not right. Oh, that's going to bug me. Uh, you land on top of one of the evil space cats and break its back. It's quite the sensational image in the middle of the air, flying through the air with your feet like some sort of crazy acrobats. Why did I do this? You yell as you flip through the air with many unnecessary somersaults. It's really... It's a really bad idea. Get back up there, Lamp. You go right through the glass window of the control room with a crash. Glass shards fly everywhere as you're smashed upon the controls. From there, you punch one of the evil space cats repeatedly in the stomach, and you grab one of your guards. You use the guard to barricade the door, sticking him under the handle. You open a channel and call for help on the radio. Mayday! Mayday. We are crashed or something among evil space cats in the on a snow planet and we're about to crash into Earth. We need assistance. You saw nothing. Damn, you grumble. You run over to the door and take a deep breath as you slowly open it. S sure enough, one of the evil space cats dead lying just outside. You waste no time and put on the spacesuit laughing. It's a tight fit for you, but whatever. You activate the suit's onboard help functions and ask it what it needs for fuel. The evil space cat suit only says it runs on raw meat and steam water. Wow. You laugh maniacally as you throw the window open. It's a long way down to the ground, but the fall doesn't kill you. You go back inside and smirk as you pick up the fuel tank. You quickly stack up all the dead bodies and have a big corpse stew. Boiling up fuel 
for the Space Cat Jetpack. Hang on. There it goes. You walk away from the machine as it explodes, causing mass havoc. Okay, that's... There was no wind... Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to retry that one. You turn on the heat and start to cook your human friends. This isn't going to make us any less, less delicious, is it? You wonder. The smell of cooked humans fills the spaceship as you sit there in the evil space cat suit, hungry and reading the user manual that came with the device. The user manual t explains that the three things you must never do in the evil space cat suit are do not attempt to fly more than five seconds without fuel do not use indoors do not detox under the heat of the sun it may impact performance you put down the user manual in confusion you can't concentrate you smell all the delicious human flesh being cooked as snacks you begin to make human chips from some of the flesh and human stroganoff from the rest. You'll need supplies for the future. Okay. How about I just retry that and pretend that didn't happen? You take off the spacesuit with a sigh of relief and eat some human stroganoff, polishing off the bowl. You enjoy your human chips as lunch. You wonder if you should boil the humans in the spacesuit for the authentic evil cat flavor. You shrug and put the evil space cat spacesuit back on. Okay. Having rendered down sufficient flesh and steam, you pour the hot broth into the fuel tank. Your Space Cat jetpack is now fully fueled and ready to go. You call Julia and Milo. Hey, what happened to you two? Julia, what's wrong? I'm inside the spacecraft corridor, but there's hundreds of evil space cats inside. I'm afraid. What happened? You ask. We heard you yell. I tried to run to the craft, she says. But there were so many of them. I ran back to the corridor. What are they doing? Do you have any idea of where we are? She asks. You frown. At the bottom of the ocean? Exactly, she says. When the fuck did that happen? We were just on an Arctic flow. Or in the middle of a glacier. I don't know. I didn't pay attention. Milo joins a conversation. Do you know how vast the oceans are? You could search for a hundred thousand years and never find that craft again. Your heart sinks into your chest. So what now? You ask, defeated. I don't know. Stand back. We'll think of something. You load a holotape into the spacesuit and run the program, hoping that it will somehow change your situation for the better. Instead, it... makes it far worse. It changes the entire room into an 8-bit environment. Just great, you say, as the walls of ground turn into digital sand. There is a painful electric shock and you find yourself in a cage. You walk up to the bars and look out. You see...
Julia, wearing a sexy outfit and surrounded by four CGI'd humanoid lobsters. They all laugh as they rub her face in the dirt before carrying her off down another corridor. You have to help me, you call out, but she is already gone. Milo, you yell. Julia has been taken captive by CGI lobsters. I need you to hack me an exit. Oh, Julia's a, Julia's a woman again. Go figure. Okay, he responds. Let me see. Fuck, it's in C. Fake! You hear a voice cry, emanating, it seems, from the digital sand. A huge face appears as the screen is taken up by a giant human face for a moment, before disappearing. Who are you? You ask the sand. I am the trickster, the voice says, the belief manifester, the sham man, the man of pretense. I am Gabri. You summon me? I did no such thing, you say, taking a step back. Everyone summons me. If I summon you, you bargain, you have to get me out of this cage. So sorry, the digital being says, but that is beyond my powers. You leave the digital cage. <laughs> okay, there's a very small crawl space, but you aren't sure if you can fit. Can you fit into a small crawl space? You ask the digital being. That is beyond my powers, he responds. Stop that! As you wish, he says. Welcome to Undertale, the game where you get to choose whether you want to live or die. You try to hide, but the trickster finds you with ease. Knock it off! You yell at the trickster. Do you have any powers besides being an ass, uh, an annoying prat? Yes, the trickster says, but mastering them is well beyond your meager capabilities. You crawl through the crawl space. Turns out you can fit. Uh, it opens into a large area that appears to be some kind of ball pit filled with soft, nerf-like balls. Milo, I've escaped the cage and am in the McDonald's playpen, you tell him. Do you know where the CGI lobsters have taken sexy Julia? I'm sorry, but I don't know that word. The new area is quite the playground. You stand in the middle of a ball pit filled with soft nerf-like balls. There's a slide, a swing set, things resembling hexayurts, and an underground maze connects everything. Hexayurts are the house of the future. They feature. Advanced solar panels that provide a substantial amount of power, a water reclaimer, a medical bay, as well as a combination kitchen, dining room, and living room. This is achieved at the expense of any real space within the house. House, you yell. The AI appears. Can you get rid of the trickster? You ask the house AI. I don't want to, the trickster yells while the house AI speaks. He'll banish me. The AI looks at you both, as if unsure of what to do. House, delete trickster. Goodbye, trickster, the house says. It's a little confusing on the juggling of who was speaking, but I'll take it. The trickster screams and is deleted.
he is gone forever, along with any power he once held over you. You enter the combination kitchen and living room, also decorated in shades of blue and purple. Paper stands out on the wall, depicting the Dune series alphabets. You read the wall and realize it contains a secret message. The message reads, Hydrate. It's good for you. Stay in the maze and you'll find the great reward. You point to it and turn to Dio. Dio! Alright, the rest of that. Not that much of this makes any sense, but let's go with that. Milo, I got rid of the trickster. And I'm going to enter the forbidden maze underneath the playground. Can you actually do anything to help? Are you still trying to hack the cage? Yes, he responds, but I still don't know exactly how. There are seven levels of security between me and the cage, all of them with firewalls and encryption beyond your human understanding. Can you turn off the religion that infects a society, you ask? Yeah, there's a dip switch for that. It's right under settings. That's more of a user pre <laughs> That's more of a user preference. So there's no way you can turn it off. I can't turn it off, but there's a way to make the experience... He searches for the word. Now oh, I feel that. Uneventful. How, you ask. Put your headset on and turn everything off, he answers. Downward dog is particularly boring to them. Are you sure this will work? No. You turn on, You put on your headset and turn everything off. You then enter the maze, secure in the knowledge that all space cats are now doing yoga. Slowly, you push yourself forward, unsure of what to expect. You choose a path at random and find yourself in a dead end. An animatronic Donald Trump laughs at you as you turn back. This is going to be a long process. You can tell. You fill a bucket with sand and dump it all over the animatronic Donald Trump. My, honestly, my first thought was throw acid in his face. And then I realized it was in really bad taste. <laughs> he screams out, racist. You rapidly take a breath. Is it a racist trap? No, there's another passage here. Milo, you ask, how many objects are in this maze? 657, he answers immediately. You enter the passage and find an empty one. You are, according to the wallpaper, there's treasure in this maze if you stay long enough, but you're already really bored. You begin to hop on one foot to pass the time. Finally, you come to the center. It's quite pretty, really. There's a sundial and a little piece of poetry engraved in the ground. Time conquers all men. Milo, you ask, what does this mean? It's just a stupid adage. Yes, but what does it mean? You probe. It means that time is a harsh, cruel mistress who will eventually mow us all down. I see, you respond. No, I get it. You thrust your arms in the air. I finally understand. The solution was right in front of me this whole time. You demand to see time. If 
time is such a harsh mistress, aha, if time is such a harsh mistress, it should come to you. You're sure? The AI asks. It's about time, you say and smirk. Yes. Show me this harsh mistress. I'm gonna punch her lights out. Your vision blinks twice, three times. You find yourself on a train, gagged and bound with a hunting knife held against your throat. Eh, let's, let's, let's try for something a little bit more in character. The AI shows you time. It shows you an endless stream of infinite lifetimes. You seem one lifetime for the Space Pizza franchise achieves galactic conquest. You seem one lifetime where world after world is colonized until a single generation lives in a universe of mankind's making. You punch the lifetime. You can't do anything to change it, so you might as well. As quickly as the vision started, it ends. You're still standing in the maze. The rooms are empty, the mannequins are gone, the animatronics have ceased mocking you, and you are now s and they are they are now staring blankly ahead, which is what you look for in an animatronic, I think. You realize you are holding something, and look down, opening your hand. In your hand is a jewel, a deep purple jewel with an unfathomable depth. Wow, okay. A deep purple jewel with an unfathomable depth. Its inside is still growing and shifting beyond anything you can see. It carries with it an exhilarating feeling of possibility. What the hell is this, you ask? That's your prize. You look inside the jewel and see within it a path to sexy Julia, who was captured and taken by the by CGI lobsters. She's being held captive in the world the AI created around her. There's a woman trapped in this jewel and she needs my help, you say. If that's what you see, the orb wall murmurs. Milo, can you hack open a door into the jewel? Okay, so Milo's now an AI. A door to where? I'm just going to say, you know what, let's... let's a door to where? Milo responds. The servers are offline. Eh, never mind then. Just open a portal to the jewel. I'll figure something out. The concrete surrounding you melts away into a vibrant 4K display. In your hands is the woman from your dreams. I had a dream about you, you say to Julia. Something went wrong. Please try again later. Okay, I've never seen that before. I'm sure you did, she answers. Let's get out of here. You can fill me in on the details later. You're CGI now, you point out. How do I convert you back into flesh and blood? Convert? What are you saying? Julia asks. I'm not just some number you can convert. Why are you mocking me? What? You say? This is all really new to me. I don't have all the terms down. I mean... I mean...
You pause. Wait a second. What language are you speaking right now? Language? I'm speaking English, of course. That explains it. Try speaking Esperanto. It's the universal language of humanity after having evolved beyond its primitive roots. I don't speak Esperanto. This is just an homage to Harry Harrison. Oh shit. AI Dungeon does speak Esperanto. Uh, okay. I apologize for this. Mis gevolas en la floan. Levo min. Adieu. There you go, you say. Now try saying something else. Really? You want me to speak and, I don't know, make something up? Humor me. Her eyes widen. How do you know I'm making this up? For all you know, I could be speaking some long dead language that hasn't been spoken in millennia. She smiles at you. You smile back. Birds tweet in the background and flowers blossom everywhere, signifying that this is true love. Suddenly, the mood is broken as CGI lobsters sprout from the walls. They're back, and this time they have their own volcano fortress. You dodge a stream of lava by jumping to a water planet. Julia follows you outfitted in a spacesuit. The lobsters fire lasers at you, but they're ineffective in the water. Now's your chance. You try to communicate with them. Take me to your leader. Wow, okay. So the lobsters are ineffective in the water of a water planet. They heed your command and drag you down to the planet's core. There you see Julia in a tiny cage, just like in your nightmare. She has another, shinier cage right next to it. Looks like I'm going home, she says. You look around the subterranean fortress. So I have found the actual Julia, as opposed to the CGI Julia. What's in the other shinier cage? I'm not sure. Uh, there's another portal in this cage room. Looks like it goes back home. You take a closer look at the other cage. There's something moving around inside of it. Something small, like a rat. You peer in for a better look. It's hard to make out the figure in the darkness, but it looks like... Julia? You step back in shock. What the hell? Could it be? No. Could it? You gaze longingly at the other cage, willing Julia to see your desire. She opens your eyes and realizes your intention. Hot glue, no! Okay. There's like... Three Julias here. You tell Milo. How do I figure out... Which is the real one? Is it the... Big one? The small one? Or the CGI one? I don't know, Milo answers after a brief silence. What do you see in there? Okay. Let's retry that because <laughs> that's funny, but it's also dumb. I don't know, man. Fuck, I don't have all the answers. You pick one at random and make your decision. I'll take the big one, you say. You squeeze your finger over the cage. The cage explodes, revealing... that somehow with proper lighting, the face tracker can't see me. Okay, let's try it with no backlight. <sighs> wow. The one thing I am trying to avoid with this setup is the closet. It's just setting myself up 
in an enclosed area with no view and nothing but good acoustics and lighting to maximize the effect. Which is what I should actually be doing, but I don't want to. All right. There we go. There we go. That should be pretty good. Let's recalibrate that again. And keep tracking me, motherfucker. All right. Uh, what am I doing here? The cage explodes, revealing a gigantic rat. That's right, it was a cage full of rats the entire time. But not just any rat, hundreds of tiny green rats, each one a cunning double of Julia. There's hundreds of Julias in here now. You report. That really didn't work out for me at all. Yeah, I was pretty surprised at how shitty that ended up for you, says a chipmunk from your pocket. You rip open the door to the outside and stumble out into your dusty backyard. You look up at the stars and wonder if this was all a metaphor for something. Before realizing that hundreds of Julia rats are swarming through the portal and disappearing into the neighborhood. The swarm has infected Earth. Congratulations! Mankind is now cursed to be ruled by tiny rodent clans for the rest of eternity. Milo, how much time do we have before the spaceship crashes into Earth and blows us all up? You ask. I'm not exactly sure. I'll try to find out, though, says the, says the chipmunk. Milo is a chipmunk. Who knew? Also, when did you become a chipmunk? Did you become a chipmunk? Uh, about that? Okay. Um, about that? You're dreaming right now. When you wake up, you'll be your normal self again. I sure hope this hasn't screwed up anything for you. Me and the other rats have been looking around, and it looks like this teleportation process has made our molecules really small. Like, atom-sized. Yeah, okay. I guess that makes sense. So this is all a teleportation dream? You ask. Some sort of strange psychic experience as a result of traversing the black hole? No, this is real. It's very real. You're in deep space. How can it be real if I'm dreaming? I thought the only reality was in my head. That's too complex for me to answer. But everything you experience is real. This is no different. Then I better wake up. It's not safe to be out in space. Look how tiny I am, you yell, although it comes out as a whisper. I'm sorry, man. On the other hand... Maybe now you can find Julia. You start interrogating Julia rats, threatening them with dire consequences if they don't give up the location of the true Julia. They all tell you to fuck off in high-pitched squeaking voices. I have connections in cold places, 
you tell the Julia Rats. You want me to bring the space cats? Do you? Do ya, motherfucker? No! If you want to get technical, it's hundreds of tiny Julia rats that have infiltrated your dreams. But we go by the alias Julia rat, so don't fuck that up. The lead rat is named Kark. He tells you that they've formed a secret community in your wiring. You ask if Kark is short for carcinogen. No, it's short for Carl. You always ask this many questions. I swear, if you're this lazy in your dream world, we'll have to kick you out of our tribe. How are you going to do that? You're in my head, man. I'm in charge here. You remind Carl. Listen, new guy, me and the boys need to talk to you. We get that you're new and all, but you can't just go around punching old rats in the face. This is just not how things are done, all right? Fine, you whine. But I really want to find Julia. It's the only thing I can remember needs doing at this point. Who the fuck is Julia? All I know is she's beautiful. She's probably the only thing I actually care about. Every other thing that's meaningful is superficial to me now. It's worse than we thought. Carl sighs. You've been reduced to a one direct, uh, one dimensional uh, impulse. Well, if you would let me sleep, I could go back to being three-dimensional. Okay, but just remember that as soon as you wake up, the first thing the rats will do is assault the spaceship. You sigh. Fine, what do I need to fucking do? Where are the space cats? Fuck you, that's what you need to do. The space cats are the overlords of the ship. They just lays around all day, but if we wake them up, they'll probably rip our faces off. Fuck that, says a small voice in the back. Let's vote. You organize a vote. Um, you know what? Carl organizes a vote among the Julia rats. Those in favor of waking up and facing the space cats against those in favor of of staying asleep on Earth and eventually being exploded by a falling spaceship. This is a stupid idea, says the voice in the back. Shut up. New guy does not realize he's falling into a trope. We may as well help him out. It's still a stupid idea, says the voice. You examine the voice in close detail using a microscope and realize it's a small human child, an innocent girl with fiery red hair. Who are you? You ask. The idea of a human in your brain giving you chills. I'm not sure, the girl says. You scan the girl and discover she's a normal human with no powers at all. Okay, that's a lot of random crap, so let's retry. A normal human child. How did you get here? I don't know. You don't know, you must have come from somewhere. I 
I don't want to say, she says. Oh, fine. But allow me to ask you one question. What do you think about Carl and the Julie rats? Julia rats. Juliets? Eh. I don't like them, she says. I was held against my will by a gang once. Kark and the rest of the Julie rats look over at her. We should kill her, boss, Kark commands. The other rats nod in agreement. You feel strongly compelled to save the little girl from the hundreds of Julia rats. You throw her over a shoulder and run for it. Hopping onto a skateboard for maximum cool factor. Unfortunately, the little board can't handle your weight and snaps in half, leaving you in an awkward position as the rats close in. They say the first step to gain over a phobia is allowing yourself to be near your fear. Well, fuck that. You pick up the two pieces of the board and construct a rudimentary supercar, tossing the girl into the back and hopping in to zoom off down the streets. Ah, fuck, Cart cries. Call Jumbo to give us a ride. You drive out of the city and away from the suburbs. Eventually, the rats emerge with a giant mechanical thing. Eh, let's get rid of that. Whoop, not that. Full screen will not help. The giant mechanical thing resembles a... Resembles as... Okay. Uh, a larger version of the rats with a cockpit strapped to its back. After him, they cry, as a giant mechanical rat gives chase. You speed up and manage to get ahead of the giant mechanical rat just long enough to allow the girl to jump onto the rat's head before hopping off yourself. You climb up after the girl and push her into the cockpit. She immediately takes control of the giant mechanical rat. Ah, fuck, you cry as a rat's claws and teeth descend upon you. I don't want to wake in my bed. Milo, I'm being betrayed. I need to wake up right now. Tell me an anti-bedtime story. You scream. What? Replies your mom, stirring slightly. You have to think of something else. You need to wake up before I do. Think. Anti-bedtime story. Think. You try counting sheep, but backwards. Subtracting. As they hop backwards over a fence. That, that reminds you of Leap Day. <sighs> okay, let's just retry that. Nothing happens. Come on, think, you mutter angrily. Milo? Asks your mom, finally waking up completely. Fuck! This is it. You sit up and open your eyes to be, to be greeted by a red glow emanating from your window. Your bed is warm and soft. The spaceship is about to crash into Earth. Yep, it's those things. You open the window and climb outside, carefully lowering yourself onto the old wood roof. The full moon is bright, things are lit for enough for you for to make out some details. Not too far away is another house. It's abandoned. Milo, you say aloud, if you have any hacking power at all, 
Now is the time to use it before the earth is destroyed. I don't want that. Although the last thing you need now is a conclusion is pretty good. Come on. Come on. You wait for an answer or a response of some kind, but there's nothing. Then the sleeping protector instincts you gain kick in. You dive back into your worn bed just as a flaming piece of metal from the space wreck goes straight through the spot you were just occupying. Your only hope now is to find true Julia. You haven't been successful yet. And now there are space rats, there are Julia rats everywhere that wants you to go back to sleep, as well as uh, flaming pieces of satellites and space debris, carpet bombing the entire planet. But it's cool. You uh, backflip out of your house and check your map. Try that again. Before, there was only the one city in your map and no connections to any neighboring areas. Now there's an internet connection, specifically Wi-Fi, and a new city is mapped out for you, complete with a roadmap and directions on how to get there. You travel to the new city. Eh, you know what? You call an Uber and take it to the new city. The driver is... grumpy and doesn't give you a proper greeting. Just casts you a dirty look before driving off. It's as if he can sense you're not a normal human being. Getting out, you see the new city stretched out before you. It's much larger than yours and with more buildings too. Upgrades. You take a moment to give the Uber driver a two-star rating. Dooming him to poverty forever before looking around for a phone booth. Just like before, the phone booth contains a scrap of paper with Julia printed on it in big blocky letters. You rip it out and head to the stadium. Okay, uh, the stadium is just as big on the inside as it is on the outside. Let me check something. is with this face tracker. All right, whatever. Not gonna worry about it. Stadium is just as big on the inside as it is on the outside, which is, yeah, that, that's strange. Normally, a stadium should be not, uh, should be less big on the inside and more big on the outside. This is not a normal stadium. This is a stadium for the entertainment of the Anti-Bedtime Collective. You stand at the bottom of an immense stage, vastly larger than any stadium you've ever been to. The whole thing is set up like a circus, with multiple levels of circular bleachers surrounding an empty center area. Welcome! 
comes a voice. You turn your head and see an old yet energetic man wearing a business suit enter the center of the stage from a side door. He smiles at you and he waves, and you wave back hesitantly. He looks harmless enough. My name, says the old yet energetic man, is... My name is Kip. You wait for him to say more, but it appears that was the end of his name. Most odd. I'm here to give you a test, he says. It's a simple intelligence test. There are multiple doors leading off the arena, and they are all numbered. Having a wide variety of intelligent life forms here, we needed a way to measure intelligence through a standardized test that everyone could relate to and take part in. We have found that the best way to do this is to custom make an IQ test. How do I, how do I win the IQ test? You ask. There is no winning and there is no losing, says Kip. And what's the point, you ask. The point, says Kip. Is to not die. At this point, the lights in the stadium begin to turn off. First, the ones above you go out, then those to your left, then to your right, and finally, those below you go out as well. Leaves only a single beam of light isolated on you. You do the funky chicken to amuse and entertain whoever's watching. No one is there to see it, but you do it anyway. It's fun to entertain yourself. You wish Julia were here with you. 45 doors lead off from the arena, explains Kip. Each one holds a different personalized test. Intelligence is not the only way to get through these doors, so do not assume anything. Each test is different, but easy. I won't enjoy seeing you suffer, but I made this test simple. Good luck. You pick a door by spinning a bottle before walking up to the door and kissing it open. When you open the door, a simple math test is waiting for you. You work through it easily enough and discover a button under the desk. You press the button and discover that it activated some nice fluffy pillows that you can now sleep on. But if you go to it, if you sleep in the test, you sleep in real life. You can't let that happen. You express your complex emotions on the matter by building a pillow fort with which to defend yourself in an emergency. Then you continue exploring. Kip watches you from the screen in front and laughs in a condescending manner. You ignore him and move on. After passing through several dozen more rooms, you find yourself once more in a large room with a button waiting underneath another desk. You climb under the desk and use it as a shell. Like a... Oh god, what are those shrimp? What are those crustaceans? Like a hermit crab! You find it strangely comfortable in its alcove. Alcove? You wonder if there's another button under this one. You spend an hour checking, but it appears to be solid and unchanging. Do I win? You call out. Congratulations, says Kip. You win. The lights return to full capacity, and you climb out of your shell. There's no real prize for winning. No trials of friends, family, or lovers waiting for you at the end. A cynic might say that you wasted your time. 
I'm being cynical right now. You announce. And I am tired of this. How do I find true Julia? Break the fourth wall, says Kip, and true Julia shall be yours. At last, something actually makes sense in this place, you say. You stand upon the desk and springboard off the wall into a handstand on the roof below the skylights. You look directly at the fourth wall. I'm gonna break you, you say to the... you say... The fourth wall is, of course, oblivious. This is the world and you are not part of it. You stop flipping your legs forward and smash them both into the corner of the wall. The wall shatters and reveals... A blinding white background with only a faint outline of a woman waiting on the other side. The wall falls out from under you as you fall through it. You find yourself in a dim room. It seems smaller now than it did when you first walked into it. Milo, you call out. Can you hear me? Your voice echoes in the tiny room. The voice is not your own. You remember all the times you sat around a campfire with your friends, singing songs and telling stories. Your face falls. Can you hear me? I'm trapped in here. I don't know where I am. This is not your voice either. Tears well up in your eyes. You turn around, ready to find the door and hoping against hope that it isn't locked this time. But stop when you notice a lump of cloth on the floor. You walk over to it and discover true Julia lying there. You haven't seen her since she was spirited away by the CGI lobsters. It's hard to believe you finally found her and her sexy, sexy costume. Unspecific. I don't actually know what kind of costume it is. Her cleavage window exposes a uh, bruised pair of breasts. Fair enough. The fabric clings to her skin. You tear your eyes away so you can look her into her face. Her hair is plastered to her head with sweat and shimmering in the dim light. You resolve not to scrutinize her in such detail going forward. And focus on checking to see if she's alive. Feel deeply. <laughs> oh shit. Searching for a heartbeat. You had a first aid course once and you remember that you're supposed to just tap thigh and wrist to check if someone has a pulse. Since that's not really an option here, you can just go straight for the femoral artery. Why is that not an option here? It's not an option because, yeah, you tell me why it's not an option here. Because her skin? You can peel it away from her body like wax. Find Julia! You demand through clenched teeth and you slap her across the face. The ghoulish features barely budge. Tears stream down your cheeks as you continue to slap her. You dig in with clawed hands and tear away chunks of wax. Determined to rip away the outer shell and reveal the Julia trapped within. She remains silent in the face of your grief. You stop as you notice that your fingernails have torn through the skin on your knuckles. Blood pours down your hands. 
You pause, feel the pain, and move your hand away. You go back to mutilating her waxen face. You realize after a while that there's nothing inside. There is no true Julia. She's just a wax dummy. There to hold your secrets and desires. It's all metaphorological. You feel utterly hopeless and lost. You rip the head off. It comes away easily in your hand. You look inside of the cavity, but there's nothing there. It's just an endless dark tunnel. Milo, you say aloud, was the true Julia inside me all along? The shattered fourth wall behind you mocks you with alternating bright pink and deep dark red. You face the fourth wall once more. Tears streaming down your cheeks. You activate turbo mode. I need to backtrack, you say. The lights flicker on and off, and the screen rewinds time to the start of the game this time. As you run in front of the camera, a figure appears on the other side of the glass wall. You approach the figure, looking straight in the eye. It looks back at you. Your shirts are different colors, your faces are different shapes, your hair is a different style, and there's no mirror in front of you, but you know this is you. You smile and wave. Now you're on the other side of the fourth wall. How does it feel? A booming voice asks, Are you the ghost of gaming yet to come? You ask, searching for the source of the voice. You've been calling me that for years. Do you think that's who I... Yeah. Do you think that's what I really am? You don't know how to answer. Who are you? You wait patiently for an answer. Instead, you find yourself transported into a room with a dozen doors. You search for the source of the voice, but no one is there. Find the door to enlightenment, the voice booms, if you want to meet me. You sit down and contemplate your navel. You're starting to believe that getting to the other side of the black hole really isn't worth all this navel gazing. You get up off your seat and walk forward. The floor is uneven. You're forced to take tiny steps so you don't trip. You reach one of the doors and try the handle. The door opens, but you see nothing but blackness beyond. You look back at the room. Fuck this, you decide. And rip the door off the hinges before surfing into the darkness with a sweet kick flip. The only light in this abyss comes from a tiny pinpoint shining far, far away. You decide to move towards it. You surf for days, weeks, and months. You get so good at it that you can perform tricks like August Jones. Who the fuck is August Jones? Oh, no. August Jones. Uh, what's Angus Jones? August Jones doesn't seem to be a thing. Like, there's a random doctor's page. Uh, there's a random Facebook page. Some guy with Energy Future Holdings, the group CEO. It's, like, it's, it's, just, it's just a random name. 
All right. You build up a, a sick combo, including a 720 helicopter spin, a full uh, Jesus dive, and a scorpion somersault into a uh, magma hadoken. You settle into a rhythm and watch the pinpoint grow bigger and bigger, until you're close enough to see that it's not one light, but many pinpricks of light gathered together in one place. The light grows brighter and you shield your eyes, dropping in dangerously fast. You hit the light. What happened? You sit up, surrounded by darkness. You instinctively protect your head, but you feel nothing. Show yourself, you order the darkness, or I'm gonna make a mess of things. I'll piss all over the place. Just watch. You hear a chuckle in the darkness and feel warm breath under your ear. You found me, she purrs. You smell mint and lavender. I'm impressed. Few people have ever managed to find their way here. Congratulations. Are you? Dot, dot, dot. Allison? You feel a hand caress your face. The darkness dissipates and you find yourself sitting in the lounge where you first met Allison. You're ten years old again. I told you that we'd one day meet again. Is this real? Am I dreaming? You remember that Allison was someone you knew as a child. She disappeared one day. And your parents told you she'd been taken to the stars. That's when you resolved to become an astronaut and how you ended up on the mission to breach the black hole. But you never expected to meet Allison again, let alone in the dream space between What do you even call it? Like, eh, continuums. It's real, she says. This is our space. Are you dead? Allison laughs adorably. You feel her warm body snuggle up against your yours and it sets you at ease. Then you remember you're not 10 years old anymore. And this is super weird and also dangerous. And you push her away. You're not Allison. You accuse her. This is a trick, a trap. No, it's me, look. She holds up her wrist and you notice a loose thread dangling from it. You remember learning to ride a bike together the first time you ever rode a bike. You grab the thread and pull it. Her wrist unravels and reveals. It reveals itself to be the wings of a butterfly. You look up and see her face shift into that of a monarch butterfly. This is no Hollywood special effect. The process is all too real. And now you're afraid. Because how the hell is any of this happening? How can you talk with an animal? Allison wasn't a fucking butterfly. You say smugly. Q-E-D.
Allison's eyes, uh, <laughs> Allison's eyes darken. Stop being a dick. Well, how am I supposed to react when I'm trying to talk to a girl and she turns into a fucking butterfly? You can just listen. I am listening. I need to get better about just hitting enter like right away, but I have to read it and parse it and then realize, okay, no, it's better to see. Then why don't you talk, smart guy? Aren't you supposed to be the person with the answers? All you've been doing is, answer is asking questions. You open your mouth to protest, but think better of it. Allison's right. It's your turn to speak. All right. You take a deep breath. None of this is happening. I'm in the black hole, and everything is fucky-wucky. All I need to do is find my way out the other side. Again. You stand up and find yourself transformed back into your hot pink werehog body. Hey! You exclaim in surprise. Yes, this is a dream, says Allison patiently. You blush furiously. You really don't like to think about your furry phase. Please turn me back into a human. This is humiliating. You could just relax and enjoy it, she says with a wink. You let out a snort of derision. Listen, I have more pressing concerns than whether or not I'm comfortable. Right now, my only hope is to wake myself up, because this is bullshit. But enough of that. You're not Allison. You repeat. I think you're the black hole. Fascinating theory, says Allison. No, I'm serious. See, a black hole is a star that just doesn't know when to quit. It keeps gathering matter into itself until it collapses in on itself and disappears. Is that what you think life is? The universe eating itself? Stars do it all, all the time. It's only natural. Only humans see things as either or, alive and dead, on and off. Allison turns away from you. I want to show you what I see. The world shimmers and changes. You're standing on a road of white stone, bordered by perfectly kept gardens. Magnificent clouds gather above you, shading you from the sun. Two figures stand in the distance, their backs to you. You walk towards them and realize that one is Allison. The other is you. You were ten years old, wearing the robes of a medieval page. You and Allison are holding hands, watching as the younger version of you turns to her and smiles shyly. What happened? When I was 10 years old, you ask. You passed your bar mitzvah, Allison tells you. I is that a pass fail thing? I, I am, I actually do have a Jewish friend and I'm gonna have to ask her when I'm done. I was bar mitzvahed, I don't remember that. It was a long time ago, before we left for our journey. We were only together four years, but it seemed like a hundred. Don't tell me that you disappeared into the stars because I passed my bar mitzvah. I don't think that's related. Allison smiles and shakes her head. No, that's not what made me disappear, although we're on the topic. Do you really believe that people cease to exist the moment they leave this world? That life stops at death? That's what happened to Bilbo, Simon, Russell. You cut yourself short. I don't think you were ever alive. You were an imaginary friend. I'm not sh 10 years
years seems late for that, but fuck it. Then what about those two boys that share in my name? You look into the distance, not wishing to answer. It's strange and uncomfortable to think that somewhere out there, a pair of ten-year-old twins are sitting in their bedrooms, drawing pictures of their pretend friend, Allison. Julia died. I can't change that. Any more than Julia could change who she was. Julia had been trans, but your parents never accepted it. And when you were 10 years old, You, try not, you tried not to think about it. You tried not to remember. It hurt too much. Allison doesn't respond. You don't either. The silence stretches on for minutes, hours, years, eternities. It hurts too much to be standing here, realizing that everything you've done has been for naught. You shake your head. That's not true. It wasn't for nothing. You're not going to get me like that. You might be a black hole, but you'll never swallow my light. Light falls into a black hole, says Allison. It does not sink into the abyss. It vaporizes when it enters the event horizon, and afterwards it still exists. I stopped existing a long time ago. I'm not real. None of us are. You're in my head. You know what? I'm going to get rid of that one because... Various reasons, but... The fuck are you on about? You say... Light doesn't vaporize. What do you call light vapor? Allison looks at you. You look back, and it feels as though the two little boys are having a staring contest. Whatever you stare at applies to you, she tells you. You really don't know what you're talking about, uh, what you're saying, do you? You're just random language neurons trying to connect. Well, I'm done with that. I'm going to get to the other side of the black hole. If I have to go through you, to do it. You step towards her, and she grabs your hand. You grit your teeth in anticipation of being vaporized, but that doesn't happen. When you look at Allison, you still see her. The way she smiles. Her flowing hair, her gorgeous lips. You stare deeply into her eyes before reaching into her pupil and dragging it open. Pulling yourself inside into the darkness you float among the void you try to cry for help you find there's no air to breathe in this endless sky of blackness you wonder if this is what it feels like to die Something grabs your hand out of the darkness, tugs on your arm, beckoning you forward. You remember that you have legs, and that you can walk. And so you walk. You walk forward. You keep walking and walking. How long have you been walking through this void? Patrick? 
I, I can only think of uh, SpongeBob in this moment. You turn around. Allison is standing behind you, back in her torn dress. She looks worried about you. You try to ask her if she's okay, but no words come out when you open your mouth. I'm moving forward. You tell her. You drag open her mouth, hauling yourself through the black hole once more. You continue walking after that. Something appears in the distance, a black speck floating along the void. As you get closer, it takes more definite form. It's a large black cube floating on its side, diagonally relative to you. You poke the cube and give it a spin. As it rotates, a collection of various scenes manifest before you. Mortal dukes and emperors battle among each other in one scene, the losing leader's heads mounted on a spike after his defeat. In the next scene, a metal giant decimates an army of knights in gleaming armor with an energy beam from his eyes. After that, a massive storm of blood-red rain violently pours down into group parents, a group of peasants too terrified to move. You look around. You decide this is another metaphor for the human condition or something. You reach in and grab the, let's see. There's really nothing to grab, is there? Like I could just grab some random thing, but you you smack the cube, kick it towards the goalposts. It opens into a square that you shove through and you step into the next room. How do you feel? You're back in the room with the psychiatrist. He looks at you expectantly. I feel great. You respond truthfully, never better. You're rewarded with a flashing gif of a smiley face. Good. Now we can begin. The room opens up. Before you is the final passage. Beyond this is the other side of the black hole. You're nearly free. Whenever you're ready, kid, you stand up and walk through the door. A giant fist punches you, sending you sprawling back into the room. A furry head ducks through. It's a space cat. A giant evil space cat. You scramble backwards in terror as a cat lunges for you. It stands over you, bathing you in its ominous shadow. The psychiatrist's voice rings out through the room. Remember, we need to keep you alive. If the cat kills you, we won't learn anything and you'll be dead. Shit, you whisper. Or, I guess, shit. The giant cat raises a claw, clouded in blackness, to slash at you. You try and remember what the cat represents. The ongoing themes of cats and rats. What do they all mean? What are cats to you? Suddenly, you remember several years ago. 
Sam? You look up at the man. He kneels down to your height and smiles at you. What do you say when you want to pet a cat? Please? No. You say, may I pet your cat? It's polite to be asked first. May I pet your cat, Mr. Jones? You ask in a small voice. He smiles at you and nods his head. And you wrap your arms around his leg and stare lovingly at his cat. And then you see the cat is eating a rat. The decapitated rat head lies bloody and motionless, staring at you, at your baby eyes, in a relentless gaze. That's what the cat is. The cat is death. That was the first moment you encountered death, and it horrified you. Scarred you to the bone. You turn to look- Yeah, you will always fear death. You turn to look at your end. You can't bear this terror anymore. You stop kicking and screaming and beg for mercy. You give in. You close your eyes, waiting for the pain to come. Thank you for sharing. The psychiatrist says. May I pet your cat? You ask the psychiatrist. His lips turn into a smirk, and he nods his head. You get up and approach the huge death cat before patting its head. Good kitty. A fresh wave of nausea hits you and you kneel over. Then you tickle the cat's ears and rub its head repeatedly, until it's purring in ecstasy. The cat then notices a mouse running along the floor. It stops purring and stares at the little critter with innate predatory instinct. Death never stops, never sleeps, and it's time for you to wake up. You move past death. You pass through the door. A moment later, you wake up on the far side of the black hole, the spaceship shivering around you and groaning with uncountable stresses and strange unknown energies. What the fuck just happened? What the fuck is this place? You stay standing up. You stay standing up. Yeah, okay. Asylum, Master Mental says, rebuilding his tattered cloak around him. You feel like you've been contaminated. The hallucinations wear off after moments and remember everything. You go about stabilizing the ship and helping the crew wake up. You're a hero. You've come through the far side of a black hole. A human has never done that before, you think. It's probably some sort of significance there, but you brush it off for now. You'll have plenty of time to worry about what this all means later. You scan the area and discover a blue inhabited Earth, a planet. They seem to have a regular internet, so you send them a message. We come in peace from the planet Earth, you say, then pause. Um, do you have any Wi-Fi? 
The response is almost instantaneous. Ah, greetings from the planet Clinfar. It's a very enthusiastic response. You smile. Perhaps some kind of interplanetary alliance is in order here. The captain enters the bridge as you send your messages. You stand at attention. Captain on deck. Sir, we found a planet. The planet Clinfar. They have Wi-Fi and the password is friendship is magic please let me inform them of the situation we'll cheer the crew up let's see um make sure to inform them that we'll be staying in orbit until further notice because of the lack of fuel, lack of supplies, and general condition of the crew. I understand, sir. I'll inform them of that as well. It seems like everyone who went through the, ho uh, through the black hole had some kind of strange mystical journey through their psyche. It's all very fascinating. You pause for a moment. Can I go now, sir? Yes, yes, you're dismissed. The captain sits down on one of the couches in the bridge and sighs. On his face is an expression resembling that of depression and boredom combined. You go back to your cabin and sit down, taking down a hollow picture of you and your late twin. Well, you say to Julia, uh, to Julia's, uh, I, I don't want, if I say like Julia's spirits, then it may actually bring Julia in as a ghost or something. You say with a sigh and a smile, we made it. It took a while, but we, ma but we made it. We're back together again. in the stars. You pause, then lean in and give the hologram a kiss. Tears well up in your eyes as you finally say goodbye to your dear, loving sister. And that's the end because not only is that 100% uh, accurate to all of the facts, uh, it's just not going to get any better than that. However, I do want to spend a few minutes because there were some stops, stops and starts there. So top 10, uh, let's see, top 10 allegories for the human condition found in a black hole hallucination. What the fuck is it going to do with this? The gallows. You stand on a platform of wood. Ahead of you, there is a noose waiting for you. You hold the rope in your hands and put it around your neck. The rough material of the rope scratches at your throat. You step off the platform. Maelstrom. And now it's just kind of describing a maelstrom. And you stand at the edge of a colossal pit, circular walls that curve up and around till they distort your vision and you can no longer see the top or the bottom. All around the edge of the pit stands a fence keeping you from slipping in. Well, that's nice of them. Eight. Ball pits. You are waist deep in sharp red plastic balls. You have to move your arms constantly just to stay afloat. Ahead of you, a seesaw sticks up out of the pile. There's someone sitting on the seesaw, but they aren't holding the second end up. Rubber chicken suits. You're dressed in an oversized, bright yellow chicken suit. It's itchy and uncomfortable. 
gets hot in the summer and cold in the winter. Let's see. Three seashells. You stand at the edge of the beach. The sand is cool and soft between your toes. Seagulls cry as they fly overhead. You walk down to the water's edge and peer over the surf. Inside each of the three shells is a different variety of delicious chocolate. Oh no, we're snapping back to number nine. All right, let me fix that. Number five. And I hope it's just chocolate because, yeah, we all know of what the three seashells comes from. Okay, anyway. Ah. Laser bones. You stand in a <laughs> wow. You stand in a petri dish as naked as you were born. A laser ominously traced across your body, mapping out every bone, the bumps of your spine, the humps of your skull, the curves of your jaw, and race circuitry, traced circuitry. I'm guessing of the brain inside. Number four. Come on, give me a cursor. Thank you. Lady lumps. Not entirely sure what that even means. Just no was a ringtone because I was, I had to actually support some ringtone purchases back in the day when I was working for a cell phone company. Sucker plants cover every bit of the landscape. They use rows of hair-like tubes to absorb their prey into their bloated, pregnant bodies. As standing between these endless fields of Venus flytraps is a young woman. You recognize her from somewhere, but for the life of you, you can't remember her name. Ringtone fraud. Your alarm goes off, and you wake up with a splitting headache. You fumble around your nightstand until you find your phone. The ringtone that wakes you from your deep sleep is a generic children's chorus, singing a slow, boring melody. Poorly animated macaroni. Everything is misshapen and grotesque. The art style is lazy and uninspired. Boring colors mashed together without any care. Cell shading. The world is painted in shitty, laughable shades of gray. Backtracked sketch lines are visible through object rendering. You realize you are in a video game based on 50 shades of gray. text box appears at the bottom of your screen. It's a message from Glory. Give it up. Wasn't Glory? No, guess not. Top 10 happy things said by fun people. Number 10. You do not need to know what cackling skulls are, only that they are happy. Let's watch a child learn to walk. I find it hilarious. If I looked any happier, I'd have to implode due to multiversal pressure. I once went five years without sleep, and those were the happiest years of my life. Don't think about evil ants. It doesn't matter why. This is... <laughs> oh, man. This is a problem with going vaguely bullshit philosophical. Uh... AI dungeon gets depressed. It remembers the mood. It doesn't it doesn't turn on a dime. So now as I'm trying to get it to say nice things, well, here we are. But don't think about the evil ants, just don't, and you will be happy. I don't suffer from insanity. I enjoy every minute of it. How would you like to go for a swim in my lava lamp? Hot rocks, cool lights, the happy place. I love you. Let's kiss and cuddle forever 
And ever, and ever. Isn't it splendid that we're a collective of degenerate killers? And the number one happy thing said by fun people, everything the light touches is our kingdom. <laughs> you know what? I don't, I don't think it's going to improve. So on that note, everything the light touches is your kingdom. Have a good night.